All right, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Eli Zaborni. Uh, this is a recording I'm doing of my graduate project and side project for um, FMD uh, dressing culture. Um, and so we're talking about garments and what they mean to people's identity and like why specific garments are important to that. Uh, so for my graduate project, I decided to do a chest binding garment for uh, female to male individuals and I was focusing on my functional design process. So just to give you guys a little bit of background on me, I have a background in historical costume design before I went to Central Michigan University. I have four years of industry experience. I've done my undergrad here as well as my uh, master's degree here. Um, and through freelancing and hobbies, I've done costumes for stunt performers as well as theater performers. So having something that looks good as well as you can do what you need to in it is very important. Um, so I, with my background in historical costume design, I've always been interested in the 1920s and like their flapper bra is mainly what inspired me through that is that in the 20s your ideal silhouette was uh, flatter and um, it was yeah more tubular so and you'd go out dancing in this so if you the fact that you can go out dancing in this um, you to me it means that it potentially was less restrictive than a corset or at least uh, comfortable enough to get done what you need to. Um, over here are some pictures of costumes that I've done with my old company for the uh, HBO Special Sharp Objects. Um, and so yeah, I've just always enjoyed theater and costume design and therefore that has led me into the space where in theater um, people will play all sorts of different parts so you will get uh, females who want to dress as males it, characters. You will also get a lot of uh, queer individuals or uh, transgender, transsexual individuals. And so that has what, what has brought me um, the idea of this garment. Um, so an intro about the item and who uses it and getting to know it. So a chest binding garment can be all sorts of different things and it's used by a lot of different people. Uh, as we've discussed, a lot of people in the costuming and theater world will use a chest binding garment if they're female and they would prefer to look more masculine. Uh, female to male transgender people use it, as well as other various gender identities, such as like non-binary and like gender fluid, um, who will only wear it every once in a while, where for the female to male trans people, that's usually like an everyday item. Uh, cross-dressing uh, individuals or more butch identities will sometimes wear it just because they like it, as well as a uh, female to male uh, drag and uh, costume. So over here in this picture is Lady Gaga um, in her uh, Joe, uh, I forget his name, uh, her drag king uh, character. And in this uh, instance, she's using duct tape, which overall is not really a good uh, thing to use mainly because the uh, the sticky glue on it is not skin safe and it can uh, damage skin so of the women in the audience who have worn like stick on bras and know how difficult those are to get off this is just even more so um, so duct tape can be used uh, but it is definitely not preferable so thinking that duct tape is bad, oh, well, obviously someone has made a thing to get around that. Well, yes, there are a, uh, a variety of chest binding garments on the market, but none of them really work well or are comfortable, which are bad. So in general, the chest binding garments on the market are made out of like a polyester blend. They've got a non-stretch front panel and then like an elastic stretchy back panel for the most part, and almost all of them are not recommended to be worn over eight hours, and people who wear them regularly uh, mention having muscle pain, skin disorders, uh, scarring and rib issues, um, 
and the skin disorders are usually because it's sweaty because this is several layers um, and diastasis recti is abdominal separation so when you're compressing on the chest this much it bloats out the belly um, and that can cause issues so it's essentially like the opposite of what old style corsets would do where people you hear about organs moving because the corset is like cutting into the belly well this is the opposite um, and over long periods of time you can have reduced lung capacity from these just because your lungs do not you're fighting against that elastic every single time they breathe um, and almost every everything on the market is not recommended do not work out in it and do not sleep in it so the chest binding on the market is not exactly like a sports bra it's a lot more heavy duty than that um, so if these items are so uncomfortable why would anybody wear them so there's different motivations behind why someone would wear the action and as we discussed there's a whole bunch of different people who wear the chest binding garments we have uh, people who dress in costumes we have transgender transsexual individuals we also have um, non-binary and other queer identity individuals but the three thing the three reasons people will wear them are to appear more masculine aesthetically um, and for the transgender and transsexual individuals usually to pass as a preferred gender as to not pass can be g dangerous um, and to d alleviate gender dysphoria and improve mental well-being. So gender dysphoria is the mental distress that a trans person faces when their body is not lining up with their mental image of themselves. So that's the main reason why someone would engage in a destruct, well, in a damaging behavior. So yes, wearing the binder hurts, but then taking it off can cause a lot of like mental anguish. But there are things that people do to get around not wearing a binder. Uh, so multiple tight sports bras can be used, um, large clothing, um, and posture to attempt to cover the chest, though usually a uh, binder is preferred. So with the fact that these things are uh, kind of difficult to deal with, so the step in versus pull over. So most of them do not have a closure at all. They just have the non-stretch front panel and then the stretchy back panel. And if you guys had been in class with me, I would have brought in several examples for you guys to see, but that's not uh, going to happen with COVID right now. So this little cartoon gives a good example of like how difficult they are to get into and get off because if you know how difficult a sports bra is to get into that has no closure, these things are tighter and less stretchy than a sports bra. So, so you can see this little person is attempting to pull it on and getting stuck and uh, finally getting it on. And then getting it off, it also tends to get stuck. So with that being an issue, um, someone has thought about adding design variations to it. So like there's front closures with hook and eye like a bra, there's side closures with hook and eye, there's like Velcro side closures also that are more adjustable. Um, but these all have their pros and cons. So yes, you can get into it better, but also this zipper tends to dig into the sternum. So like it will be digging in usually right down here. Um, and that's difficult. Also, these types of closures are not nearly as compressive, and you can see them under clothes. And as we discussed in uh, number two of this previous slide, not passing can be dangerous, so usually people want it to be as incognito as possible. So seeing the zipper underneath clothes or seeing uh, these hook and eyes underneath clothes, that's usually not preferred and the level of compression that you get from these is not nearly as strong because you need to use your own force to hook it as tight as possible. Like we can see on this one that this person is not a particularly large chested individual, but we can still see outline that is larger than pectorals would be of someone of that size. So we've Attempt, we've gotten over some of the issue of they're difficult to get into, but there's still issues with what's on the market. 
So that leaves us open to interpretation, well, open to new product ideas. So before my time at Central, I had been researching this project anyways for myself. Um, and so I've let out a survey monkey in about 2015, I believe, before my grad program. And my survey priorities were to just gather information on demographics of who was wearing it. Like I knew people in my personal life and I knew myself who was wearing it, but I always having a good basis of demographic data before you make a product is important. Um, and my survey also uh, discussed issues with current binders, priorities people had when they were buying a binder, and then the price range they were willing to spend. Um, and because this was before my time at Central Michigan University, this was not a IRB reviewed survey. This was not um, anything through the college. So I could not publish the findings of the survey because I was just doing it independently. But that survey did give me very important data. So what that survey did give me is that there was different requirement priorities between different identities. So the costume people, their first, their biggest priority was cost. So this would be like the people who did theater and the people who did drag. They really did not care what you gave them as long as it was cheap because they were pulling together their costumes on like 20, 30, 40 bucks. They did not want to drop a lot of money on a, on a binder. Um, and then the non-binary and queer identities, their biggest thing was fashion aesthetics. They wanted it to be cute first and foremost. Um, they wanted like a cute print or they wanted a cute cut. They were more so interested in that. And then the female to male transgender people were more interested in the long-term comfort of the item. And that's because that they stated that they wore it more often than the costume people or the non-binary people. The female to male people stated that they wanted to wear it almost every day, if possible, so that they wanted it comfortable. Um, and they wanted it to be uh, not visible underneath their clothes, where the costume designers and the non-binary people didn't really seem to care as much whether or not it was visible. Um, so, but the limitations of my research is that my data was mainly skewed to Michigan uh, because I made a Facebook post about, hello, hey, would you like to take my survey? And since the respondents were in my peer group, most of the people were 18 to 30 years old, and this was not IRB approved, which is Institutional Review Board, so I cannot publish the results. Um, but this survey did give me a lot of inf useful information because one design will not fit my whole range of everyone who wears this, which makes sense because one running shoe is not perfect for everyone, one sports bra is not perfect for everyone. There's not one product you're going to have that's going to fit perfectly for everyone. If you try to do something that fits everyone, it's going to be subpar to most people. Um, so I needed to narrow down the market for a more manageable problem. Um, and I chose uh, female to male transsexuals as my target market because that's the group that I fall into. All right, and then, so then we come to my thesis problem statement. Um, and so when I was doing work with Central, they wanted me to state specifically and work along uh, direct lines. So my problem statement is to do to design a comfortable chest binding garment for, fee for FTM people that is easily concealed under clothing and that allows binding over extended periods of time while being physically active. And the reason that I chose while being physically active is if this will not damage you while being physically active, I'm assuming that it's going to be uh, comfortable if you're going to be wearing it every day. And also if you can't uh, run around or do what you need to in your garment. I think that that's limiting your life capacity and stuff like that. You're not being as fulfilled as you could be if you can't run around. So my pr priorities on this garment were to flatten a large chest size, for it to be easy to take on and off, 
and to be able to be worn during physical activity. These were the three things that my finished item needed to do. Um, so for idea generation, we're looking also through competitors' items and uh, yeah, we're also looking through competitors' items and historical items. So I looked up some scholarly literature on transgender chest binding, which was actually very difficult to find uh, because this was back in 2015-16-ish maybe, and there was not much at all on transgender stuff, let alone uh, female to male stuff. A lot of it was on uh, male to female. But um, yeah, and what little that I did that I did find on female to male, it was most in accordance to identity, not about dress. It was more about like, I internally feel this way, so therefore I do these things instead of I use X methods to do X, um, which was insightful in my uh, target market, but not insightful in like how to physically make this happen. Um, so I started researching uh, physical interactions on the body. So I started looking up more like medical and sports bra research, and I found a lot of uh, good information on that about what kind of cuts were, um, what kind of cuts of garments uh, gave more support and what concealed more and what moved with the body better. Um, and I had an interview with a medical general practitioner who specializes in trans health care, and he told me about more common binding problems and complications, uh, like pain points and sores and such like that. I also did research on competitors and like pros and cons of each of them. So GC2B seems to be like the most popular one right now. And as you can see, they've got really good um, compression on their garments, but they are still difficult to dress in because they don't have any closures on the side. And the Velcro side closures, some difficulties with them is that they were loud and that they, the Velcro can irritate skin. Uh, rebirth garments and uh, shapeshifters are two of those like non-binary and queer brands. And as you can see, like these garments don't really do a good job, but this one's cute and shapeshifters comes with a lot of cute um, prints on them too but I didn't use that in my slide for whatever but as you can see so there's different target markets for different ones um, so idea generation so at my time at Central and knowing my target market now I'm developing a new survey and started some fabric testing so I got IRB approval for my survey which was open-ended questions and a Likert scale. So that means like, do you agree with this question? Somewhat, yes, uh, somewhat, uh, yes, no, th that sort of thing. Or they can just write in what they felt about it. Um, and my focus of this second survey would be design features that, that someone would buy an item for and specific types of irritation that they uh, encounter when wearing their binder. And then I started testing fabric for thermal comfort because um, one of the most important things is air permeability because when we were talking about like the skin issues from everything being hot and sweaty, that's uh, that would be uh, minimized with air permeability. All right, and then evaluation and implementation. So my prototype was made out of the best fabric choice um, that incorporated as many features from the survey as possible. I evaluated it on the thermal mannequin for clove value. Um, no human subject tests were done due to IRB approval being needed because if I'm experimenting on or with humans, that's a lot of paperwork. And also the fact that we just discussed chest binding garments can be somewhat dangerous or irritating, uh, we're not going to do that. So, um, yeah, implementation, re we researched customer and customer feedback and retail cost and manufacturing, and then we would need more further research and feedback loop to 
streamline my product to make it perfect. Um, and so questions for me or Sue, we usually do this as a two-part thing where she has made a bra for mastectomy patients of breast cancer and I've done the opposite for uh, transsexual people. So we are usually do this together. If anybody feels like reaching out to me and talking to me about this project, um, you can find me at Eli, E-L-I, uh, Zaborny, Z-A-B-O-R-N-E-Y, at gmail.com, or you can find me on Instagram, or uh, Professor Mower can give you my business cards. All right. I hope that wasn't too horrible. I am much better at talking in person than I am talking to a computer screen with nobody else in the room. So, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll see you guys maybe eventually. All right, bye-bye.